listening to the Cover Two with Philip Jordan. Philip and friends break down the latest news in college and professional football every week. So let's get this thing started and snap the football. Hut, hut, hike. Welcome everybody to episode 48 of the Cover Two with Philip Jordan. I am your host, Philip Jordan. Thanks for checking out the show and making it a part of your day. I got a fantastic show planned for you guys this week. Troy Sadowski, 1988 All American tight end for the Georgia Bulldogs and nine year NFL veteran, will be on the show to talk all things Georgia Bulldogs and get his take on the transfer portal and just the wave of transfers going on in college football. Now, we had a pretty good 30 minute conversation, and I think you guys are going to enjoy uh, hearing what Troy has to say about many topics, you know mainly about the Georgia Bulldogs. I mean, they are going to be one of the favorites for the national championship next season. So uh, his take uh, on all things Georgia was pretty interesting. And also later on in the show, I'm going to give you my thoughts on four of the top quarterback prospects coming up in this year's NFL draft. The Combine is starting this week. The podcast is dropping on Wednesday. The Combine starts on Thursday. So we're going to talk about that. I'll talk about some more quarterback prospects next week, kind of divide that up, and also give my thoughts on week three of the Alliance of American Football. So a lot of stuff here on this week's edition of the show. And before we get into all of that, let you guys know you can find me and the podcast. Of course, you can find me on Twitter at the Phil Jordan. You can find the show on Twitter. Just look up Cover 2 Football Report. It's called that right now because Facebook's being weird, won't let me fix the name of it, so it's temporarily right now the cover two football report or just look up the username cover two phil jordan very easy to find uh you can find a podcast on apple Podcasts, google play music soundcloud spreaker tune in and youtube also on spotify and if you are on apple podcast please subscribe rate and review really helps out the show when you review and rate it and if you do leave a review i will read it on a future edition of the show and, of course, also you can find all my work over at Last Word on College Football. Everybody joining me now on the cover two is Troy Sadowski, 1988 All-American tight end for the Georgia Bulldogs and also spent nine years in the National Football League. Uh, Troy, it's been a while since we uh, we spoke here on the podcast, but uh, I hope all is well, and uh, thanks for joining me this week. Everything's fantastic. I'm glad to be back, but when you said 1988, that makes I feel really old now. Um. Well, eighties were a good time. I'm sure it was a fun year that year. <laughs> yes, it was. Uh yeah. I'm, I'm glad to have you on. We're going to talk. I think we're going to jump on a bunch of topics, especially pertaining uh, toward you know about the Georgia Bulldogs. And I guess I wanted to start off with most recent news related to Georgia. And I think this is a bigger deal on the Auburn side of things. But you know. You know, you played at Georgia. You played in the rivalry, Auburn, Georgia. It's, it's, you know, I'm used to it my whole life as being in November before the Alabama game when Auburn plays Georgia. Just what are your thoughts then moving that game out of that spot and potentially putting it in September or October? I thought it was a little bizarre because it has always been a fixture uh, on the schedule uh, for, for Georgia, uh, you know, to finish up. Uh, with Auburn and Tech that way. And now, I mean, I, I just don't know if it's going to be uh, an advantage or disadvantage for either team. I don't, maybe so. It depends on, uh, you know, home field. Uh, I know that they were talking about trying to keep away from certain back to back games with Auburn, Alabama, uh, Georgia, Alabama, things like that. I don't know. I really haven't studied it enough and looked at it enough to see uh, who it's going to benefit the most. Yeah, I guess for me, I guess me living here in Alabama, it just feels like that was an, it was more of an Auburn thing, maybe, because, you know, playing, because how good Georgia is now and you're dealing with Nick Saban too, playing them so close to each other, maybe took a lot of Auburn. Uh, A lot of people think that two years ago when they lost the Georgia SEC championship game, playing Georgia Alabama those back to back games took a lot out of them. I don't know. It just feels like this is more for just for me, just kinda of what I'm hearing people say around here in the state that it was more it's more beneficial for Auburn to move it back early in the year than maybe Georgia. Well, I mean it um, 
looking at it and thinking about it a little bit more, uh, I can understand what you're saying as far as uh, benefiting for, for Auburn. And, but it's just, it, it's, it's odd that it would come in the 2020 season, but them, you know, how, how it came about, how mm-hmm. it was brought to the SEC, the, the conference, and for them to make a decision on it. You know, of course, the Georgia fans are thinking that it's just Gus, Gus Malzahn whining and he wants his way. Uh, but I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of underlying reasons to why, uh, and those will probably unravel uh, when football season starts coming around again. Yeah, if uh, all, some Auburn fans get their way, he may not get to see 2020 when it's in a different spot. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm not going to get off on Gus Miles on today because we won't even get to the Georgia stuff. So, uh, uh, if of Georgia, the way the season ended for me was curious. Not the Alabama loss in SEC championship, which I'm going to get to that with you too, but you know, losing to Texas the way they did, and and then you know there were some players to. You know, departing Georgia, and not Justin Fields transferring, but you know, you had Nico Hardman leaving, Riley Ridley, Isaiah Holyfield, you know, Isaac Nada. Some players. I mean, I all think those are fantastic and really good players. But I kind of was wondering, why are you leaving? Because I'm not sure you're. If you, they have came back, I think they could be better draft picks if they came back for another year, compete for a championship with Georgia. Just what was your read on how everything kind of ended the the way it did for Georgia? Uh, again, I'm going to use the word bizarre. Uh, that wasn't, uh, you know, when the the team started the season, I'm sure that wasn't how they wanted to finish up. Uh, I saw a lackluster performance in the Sugar Bowl versus Texas. Uh, the sad thing is, is that as uh, horrible as they played, they still had an opportunity to win the game, which is kind of scary. They would have had their minds in it the entire time. Uh, they probably could have pulled out a win there. But um, people leaving early, it seems to be one of those things these days that uh, that's what players do. They feel that they get to a point uh, that somebody has advised them that they're not going to better their draft stock uh, by staying around another year. They could potentially get hurt and lose that opportunity to go to the next level. Uh, so they go ahead and make a decision to leave. Uh, I am a big believer that uh, when I give my word, when I when I told Coach Dooley that I was going to play football at the University of Georgia, that I'm going to be there the duration of my eligibility, and I'm going to do that. Uh, being able to put that uh, iconic Georgia helmet on uh, and wear that G one more time was just uh, that that was a big deal for people back then now it doesn't seem to be that way so uh, I I wish them the best uh, when it comes to making it you know that attempt to that next level uh, because it is it is it is a tough jump um, I wish they would have stayed around because these uh, guys um, they, they could have really had something special if they came back for one more year yeah, and uh, looking at Isaac now, I play tight in your position, just uh, and you know you play in the league. So, what is your thoughts on him making that jump to the National Football League? I think he's a uh, now is a phenomenal player. Uh, I think that he could get a little bit better when it comes to pass protection, blocking, especially on the point of attack. But the, he he definitely has the skills and the ability to make it to that next level. Uh, I just wish that he. I uh, would have come back, work a little bit more on those things. Uh, and who knows? I mean, I've heard his name being tossed around as a uh, potential middle to late first round pick, second round, third round. Who knows? It just, uh, uh, you're going to have to wait for the draft. And I'm sure that uh, a lot of these guys have uh, received their invitations to the NFL Combine. That'll give them another chance to to go up there and and show their stuff in front of all the scouts and the coaches. And then, of course, they have the pro days where the teams come in. uh, They'll come into Athens and they'll watch the players work out uh, individually there as well. You know, and it, I, I kind of alluded to a little bit a few minutes ago, but the the Alabama loss in SEC championship game, and of course, the year after you lost in the national championship game, both times double digit. 
you know, leads were lost by Georgia. They let out, you know, Alabama came back on them. They, you know, gave up those big leads. And my question for you about that is because I honestly, I mean, right now we're sitting here in the February, but I do believe Alabama and Georgia will play again in 2019 for the SEC championship. So let's, you know, let's kind of play a what if game, I guess. If Georgia goes in that game and they have a lead once again on Alabama, you know, as someone has played the game, is that something that can creep into your mind, though? You now, two times in a row, you weren't able to close the deal against the team. Is that something that might creep into your mind once again? And how do you fight against that? Oh, absolutely. Uh, that will always be in the back of their minds that uh, the, those two uh, losses and those big games like that. But I know that uh, uh, Kirby has been working with these kids. And he's trying uh, to get that stuff out of their minds. Um, there is a new, renewed uh, vigor and attitude when it comes to uh, uh, the players these days. I know that uh, a former player that I played with, Tim Worley, had some very choice words and uh, things that uh, he made public after that uh, Sugar Bowl loss on how this uh, football team was not a team. There was more of I, 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 me, me, me than team, team, team. And I know that uh, that Kirby and them have talked about that and I think that they're addressing those things. But uh, I feel that, that uh, Alabama and, and Georgia, again, are on a, they'll be on a collision course. Uh, and I think this time uh, the Georgia players will get over that hump uh, and things will be different from that point. Now, um, will they see each other in the SEC championship? I think so. And I think they could see each other again in the playoffs as well. Yeah, and I think the one thing I took away the most for Georgia in that in that SEC championship game, I know they lost, but I think they, in a way, gave Clemson a blueprint on what to do with Tua. I mean, Oklahoma defensively just, I don't think, able to do it. He seemed now, I have seen, he is a quarterback that's rhythm. And Georgia did a good job there of knocking him off his rhythm. And I don't think if he doesn't improve that on being able to more, when things go off schedule, Georgia is talented enough to give him issues with that once again. And, and I agree with you. They uh, they did knock him off of his rhythm. And uh, as a quarterback, it has a lot to do with timing. Um, and they disrupted his timing by putting pressure on him and making him move around. Now, uh, making him move around in certain ways, uh, that that's that's kind of like a potluck thing because uh, Tua is a very good quarterback uh, when he is on the move, especially when he's rolling to his left side because he's a left-hander. Uh, but they were able to put pressure on him up the middle and make him do things that he wasn't comfortable doing, and it did expose that. And I think that you saw the same thing uh, with Clemson. And that game, that national championship game, I don't think anybody in the country was going to beat Clemson that night. I I heard it said, and I believe this, it looked like Clemson had prepared for Alabama for a month and Alabama prepared for a week. Oh, I I completely agree with that. That that was something, uh, you know, and, and that's one of the big arguments when it comes to the SEC versus the ACC. Uh, how would Clemson fare playing an SEC-type schedule? Uh, I, the world I may it. never know. I, th- I think they do okay. <laughs> With that talent, yeah. I, think I think they would be I good. I think they would, too. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a big uh, Dabo Swinney fan. Uh, a lot of people don't like them. I think that that's that same thing with Nick Saban. They're successful. They win. Uh, and that's what the bottom line is. They're winners. You know, and, you know, talk about those guys. And that's where Kirby wants to get with Georgia. He wants to get that championship, get to that level that Nick Saban and Dabo Sweeney's at. Just how close do you think they are to that? And, and just, you know, overall, what's your thoughts after three years of Kirby? Is there anything else uh, he needs to improve on there at Georgia? They are knocking on the door. Um, and I think that they're uh, a football program that is ready to take that next step to elite status. Uh, the way they've been recruiting, 
the past three seasons has been phenomenal. They've been able to ma- uh, match tit for tat with Clemson, Oklahoma, Alabama, and I, I think they've come out. They've been in the top three uh, classes the last three years, and it's starting to show they are putting together uh, a very powerful football team. Uh, not only is it going to be powerful, it's going to be deep. They got a lot of players that can play some football, and as they mature when it comes to playing major college football, especially in the SEC, I think you're going to see a team uh, that will be dominant. You know, and it, we're going to be interesting with the offense. How much is going to look different? Because, you know, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I was kind of shocked that Jim Chaney left to go to Tennessee. Now, I, I read some pe- stuff and some people, you know, maybe there was, I don't know if there was any issues with there with Jim Chaney and the offense. Just, uh, what are you expecting now with, you know, him not being there offensively uh, for Georgia? And uh, do you think there were any issues within the locker room with him? You know, I don't know. I know that with the fan base, there was a lot of people that uh, uh, expressed some displeasure when it came to his play calling. Um, I can't speak for that. Uh, I'm not in, able to put myself into the seat or the mind of uh, uh, an offensive coordinator when it comes to what they're seeing uh, and versus the play calling. Uh, I know that uh, the, the new coordinator... Uh, it, it, people are expecting him to open it up a little bit more. Uh, I was listening to um, Brandon Adams, um, his dog nation, and they were talking about teams and that their percentages and how many uh, long balls that they throw over 20 yards per game. And that, you know, teams like Clemson and Oklahoma and Alabama, uh, they had – a little bit higher ratio when it comes to passes over 20 yards, whereas Georgia didn't have that. And how that, uh, pushing that ball downfield, how it opens up. And that's one of the things that I was really disappointed at with last year with our team. I thought we had the talent to push the ball down the field. I don't think we really tried as much as we should have. And I think that was reflective in uh, the play calling. The um uh, you know, the theory of, hey, I'm going to pound the football uh, and make you come up and then I'm going to throw a deep. We never saw that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we never really saw that. And I think Georgia had some of the players with uh, Hardman and uh, Ridley and, and Holloman. I mean, Holloman, he's like six foot five. You know, those back shoulder uh, throws down the field, uh, you would think that, that, that uh, they would be able to hit at least two or three of those a game. Uh, I think that that would light, you know, teams tend to uh, load the box versus Georgia because they know that their play calling is going to be heavy run. Um, so they do that. we got to loosen these defenses up a little bit. And those down-the-field throws, I think, will help that. And I think that's what Jake Fromm is looking for uh, out of this new coordinator. Yeah, and, you know, it's going to be interesting to me with Georgia to see the receiver core, you know, how that shakes out. Because, you know, we mentioned, you know, Ridley's going to be gone, Hardman's gone, Godwin, you know, and tight end. Isaac Nata, so finding new guys to step up and be the go-to guys in the offense at receiver, that's going to be an interesting storyline, I think, through spring and fall going into next season as well. Oh, absolutely. There's going to be a lot of opportunity for some of these young guys to step up and, and show – uh, Kirby and the staff that they are the ones uh, that need to have the playing time, need to get that playing time, get those opportunities. I must definitely. Uh, now I want to transition to a topic. Uh, you know, we talked about a little bit uh, off air before we got to recording here on the podcast. And you know, first it starts off with Justin Fields transferring. You know, I guess you know couldn't beat out Jake Fromm, so he's heading to Ohio State. You know, and I told you off here, I just didn't feel like you know they found a loophole for him to be able to play next season. I don't feel like he should. He should have to sit out. Uh, that's not a circumstance. I don't think that you know where he should automatically get to play. Uh, I know uh, you have a, a take on the uh, transfer stuff. Just what's your? I mean, and you mentioned it to me before our quarter free agency in college football, and I think you're going down a slippery slope here with college football if you continue with this trend that's going with the transfers. 
Oh, I agree. I am not a big fan of the uh, transfer portal. I, I do think it is bringing in uh, free agency into the college uh, or the collegiate atmosphere, and I think that uh, Pandora's box is going to be open. And I think Justin Fields, I uh, wish him the best, but I think that uh, they have laid a blueprint on how this is going to happen. And I would not be shocked in the near future that we see a, a football player, and it might it, it might be another sport, I don't know, but I'm just going to say football, uh, that could play for four different schools, win four different conference championships, and win four national championships. Because all they have to do is transfer to another school that where they feel that they have a better opportunity, and they can just use that blueprint that uh, Justin Fields and his attorney have laid for everybody to watch um, and just say, hey, it's a better atmosphere for me. And they use that as the excuse. I would not be shocked to see players doing that. Yeah, because it was just interesting just, you know, after the season ended, all the, you know, and I know it's not just quarterbacks doing it, but I mean, that's the, the big position you keep an eye on with all the transfers. Um, you know, like a Jalen Hurts situation, you know, he graduated, he's a graduate transfer, he wants to continue playing. You know, I'm okay with that. And like if you had a, you know, a relative sick or close by, we mentioned and talked about that before we got recording here this evening. Uh, that's the situation. But just going somewhere, just because I guess you can't beat somebody out, that's just, you know, I think that kind of gets away from, I think, what college athletics is supposed to be about. Oh, absolutely. And to, to go back to uh, the Georgia situation with Fromm and Fields, uh, I have a very reliable source that I, that I, won't, I won't throw them under the bus, but um, that it said that the, the Georgia staff, Kirby and the staff, gave uh, Justin Fields the opportunity to compete for the starting job. And over the the spring that he was there and the preseason and everything and during the season, he could not close that gap on Jay Fromm. And that was one of the biggest reasons why they couldn't make the switch. Now, that has a lot to do with uh, reading defenses, processing defenses and what the defense is trying to do to you, your offensive game plan, leadership, uh, all that is a factor in, you know, who the better quarterback is. And he could never close that gap. And, and I understand that. I mean, he was he was a true freshman. Uh, it's it's rare that you have a guy that can come in and do that. Uh, you know, Jake Fromm had that ability and had that opportunity to do that when Jacob Eason got hurt. But uh, give Jake Fromm some credit. Uh, he... Uh, fought off Eason and fought off Fields and kept the position himself. So it's going to be really interesting this year to see him and see how he develops because he's not going to have to look over his shoulder and say, hey, what about the guy behind me? Oh, yeah, so he'll have, full, he'll have full control of the offense, and I think it's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, and, you know, if you talk about Eason, I'm going to intrigue see how he does at Washington because, you know, I would assume he ends up being the starter there uh, with Chris Peterson. Um, I think he's a he's a talent, too. I think I've seen some uh, NFL uh, draft guru or expert say, like, during the season, they think there could be a draft where Fromm and Eason are the first two quarterbacks taken, and that would be an interesting storyline and for Georgia because Eason was there at one time, too. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, or maybe they, uh, make it to the playoffs and they see each other and play against each other in the playoffs. That'd be, that would be an interesting battle as well. You know, and I'll say this with their situation, you know, from the previous season, they both handled that with class, you know, and I think Eason didn't try to make himself, you know, make a big story out of it. Uh, him losing a job and then his transfer. I, I was really impressed with how both those kids handled that whole situation too. Uh, oh, absolutely. And uh, big ups to Jacob Eason. He didn't make anything a distraction. Uh, and then uh, it's a uh, Mercedes Benz Dome in Atlanta after Georgia lost. Uh, the first person that was waiting uh, 
in the tunnel to greet Jake Fromm was Jacob Eason. And, and I think that speaks volumes of him as a friend and as a player and a teammate that he sat there and waited on Jake Fromm. And he was the first person that when he walked into the tunnel, he saw and they, uh, he gave him a hug, his arm around him and walked him into the locker room. Um, another guy that I, uh, I wish him the best. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like I said, I'm intrigued to see him play in Washington, how he can, uh, do out there and should be a good team anyways. Um, before we close this out, you know, I told you before we got on doing this segment called Five Questions, Five Fun Questions, uh, to end the conversation. So are you ready uh, for five questions? Yes, sir. Fire away. It's the who, what, where, when, why, and how. Let's find out what's on the mind of today's guest with five questions on the Cover 2 Football Report. All right. The first question is, and now this one could be college or your pro career, your best win in college or pros? Best win in college probably would have been the 1985 Florida-Georgia game uh, when they were ranked number one in the country. And we came in and ended up beating them 24-3. to As far as uh, pro level, I would say um, in Pittsburgh when uh, we beat the New England Patriots in the divisional playoff game, which vaulted us to the AFC Championship game. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number two, outside of football, uh, what was your favorite sport? Baseball. Uh, my dad was a professional baseball player for the uh, Milwaukee Braves and the the Boston Red Sox. I had two uncles uh, that also played. So there was Ed, Ted, and Bob. And we were a, a sports oriented family. Uh, baseball was number one. Uh, but I really enjoyed that. Some of my earliest childhood memories was going down to Murphy Candler Park uh, and my dad throwing me uh, trash cans full of baseballs. And uh, how is an eight, nine, ten year old little boy? Uh, seeing your dad on the mound like that and throwing you uh, 85, 90 mile an hour fastballs. <laughs> uh, those those were some uh, beautiful times. Okay. Uh, favorite stadium you ever played at as a visitor? As a visitor, probably would have been uh, Jordan Hare. Uh, phenomenal atmosphere, very intense atmosphere, and extremely loud. They, they have a, a great fan base, and that is one of the loudest stadiums uh, when they get uh, behind their team and very difficult to play. We did have that opportunity, and we went over there and beat them in Jordan here. Um, so that uh, we quieted the stadium down uh, pretty quickly that game. Yeah, Jordan Hare can be loud. I've I've been there a couple of times. It is a loud environment. Um, number eighty seven. Was there a story or a reason behind the number? No. Um, when uh, when I was in high school, I used to wear number eighty, and um, the reason I wore that, my favorite player was Kellen Winslow, tight end for the San Diego Chargers. But when I got to uh, the University of Georgia. Um, 80 was already taken. So there needed to be another uh, 80 number available. And at that time, 87 was the next available one. So that's the one that I was stuck with. All right. Now, this is a Athens question. And I, I asked this question, or uh, I just related to this kind of question to everybody. So if you're going through Athens, what is the best place to find some food? Weaver D's. Um, if you like uh, fried chicken, southern cooking, uh, Weaver D's uh, is the best place to find that. Okay, I, I, I love my fried chicken. So if I'm ever in Athens for a game, I have to I have to make sure to stop look, there. Look, absolutely, you uh, he they will not disappoint. 
I'll take your word for it on that one. And uh, I appreciate you uh, taking time out to be on this week's episode of the Cover 2. It was a lot of fun talking uh, Georgia football and just college football. Would you? Um, so what's going on nowadays? Uh, what you got going on? Well, I just did doing my work. Uh, you know, I have, have uh, Cornerstone State planning, and we uh, work with the, uh, the the Free Will Baptist Foundation. Uh, and we travel around and do estate planning uh, in the local churches with their around. The, I think we've been to about uh, probably twenty states that we've been to, but uh, just traveling, doing work, and uh, always uh, just trying to. Stay ahead, trying to trying to make it in this world. But uh, I really do appreciate uh, the opportunities to come on and uh, talk with you guys. And uh, in the future, if you guys need me for anything, please do not hesitate to reach out and call. I will. I appreciate you taking the time uh, to be on the show, and I'm sure we'll talk some more Georgia football sometime down the road as we get closer to the season and all that. No, oh, absolutely. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Go dogs. Once again, thanks to Troy Sadowski for being on this week's edition of the Cover 2 podcast. And now I want to look over four, the pretty much the four biggest, in my opinion, prospects for the NFL draft. And something else I think I'm going to do on next week's show is go through each NFL teams who may need to draft the quarterback and why and kind of break that down as well next week. So look out for that on next week's show and i have a good guest lined up next week as well as i usually try to do for you guys all right first up, i want to look at and some people have dwayne haskins as their top prospect some have Kyler murray i'm gonna go with dwayne haskins and just physically he looks like an nfl quarterback six foot three 220 pounds and the numbers he broke some of drew Brees' records in the big 10 this past year he threw for over 4800 yards 50 touchdowns, only eight interceptions. And a big stat I think NFL people will look at is completion percentage. Last year's draft, a big knock on Josh Allen coming out of Wyoming, who eventually got drafted by the Buffalo Bills, was his completion percentage in the 50s. Now, Dwayne Haskins has a 70% completion percentage now, but that also can be misleading because there are some times I think he does have some consistency issues. Not he doesn't run a lot. He can move in the pocket to continue to play, but he's not going to be a runner. I mean, he only ran for 108 yards. Despite what Stephen A. Smith said, he thinks he's a better runner than Kyler Murray, but Haskins is a pocket passer. I do think sometimes maybe he hangs in the pocket too long and does not use his athleticism that he should, and that's probably why he got sacked 20 times last season. And the game that really stuck out to me with Dwayne Haskins last year was against Michigan. Look, Michigan maybe is a slow defense. They're a Big Ten defense. Maybe they're not as fast as you know what most of my audience is, which is in the Southeast, used to seeing with the SEC defenses to speed. But look, Michigan was the number two ranked defense in college football last season. And he lit them up. He lit them up for 396 yards, six touchdowns. He didn't throw an interception in the game. He was 20 of 31, so very accurate in the game as well. And he does fit the bill. Now, I, I think he does need to work on some things. I don't necessarily think he is ready to start game one for an NFL team next season. But I do think he is the best quarterback prospect coming out this season, which that whole thing would have changed if Justin Herbert from over at uh, – Oregon had came out, but he didn't. And he'll probably be projected as the top pick, him and Tua, uh, for next season. That's something else I might do in a few weeks, too. Talk about uh, next season's top prospects to come out and go into the uh, NFL draft. But for him, I think he's the top one. I could see the Giants taking him. Uh, kind of teaser for what I'm going to be doing next week on the show. Uh, comparison, I see Dante Culpepper. A lot of people remember the end of Dante Culpepper's career. Early on, big quarterback, mobile, didn't necessarily have to use it, strong arm, and once again, a big guy like Dwayne Haskins here. So that's where I get that comparison. Also, maybe a little bit of Ben Roethlisberger, too. Uh, Miami, Ohio, early Steelers Ben, you know, not Ben now. Where he's a lot bigger, maybe borderline out of shape. But I do that comparison because, like I said, Big Ben's not a guy that 
is going to run out of pocket. In his younger years, he was a lot more athletic. And Haskins is a very athletic quarterback. He just doesn't use it to run. He uses it to keep the play alive in the pocket, just like Ben Roethlisberger did. Kyler Murray, Oklahoma, and of course he won the Heisman Trophy. And a lot of people make a big deal of his size. Five foot ten, one ninety five is what he's listed as. I, I honestly believe he's five seven or five eight. I do compare him to Russell Wilson, and may, maybe a little bit of Baker Mayfield. And both those quarterbacks were looked at. They're too short. I really think that's a narrative that's not really there with quarterbacks anymore. And my thing with Kyler Murray is, yes, he's small. And if he does take a lot of hits, he probably will be more susceptible to some injuries. But for people who watch college football, ask yourself this question. How many times with Oklahoma did he really take a big shot? He ran for over a 1,000 yards, so there was always opportunities for him to take one. I don't really remember him taking a whole lot of really tough hits. Seems like he's aware. He knows to get out of the pocket, get out of bounds, I mean, and also avoid hits, avoid the big hits. And that's a big thing because that's something Russell Wilson's really good at with the Seahawks. If you watch Seattle play, that's another example I'm going to throw out there. If you're an NFL fan, how many times do you see Russell Wilson take a big hit? You, you rarely do. He gets out of bounds. He knows when to slide. Hey, baseball. He was a baseball guy as well, Texas Rangers. And, of course, there's that whole baseball thing. It does seem like... Kyler Murray is dedicated to being a football player. Maybe he just likes football more. And I know a lot of people say he's thrown away money. Look, yeah, he, he got a big contract with Major League Baseball to Oakland Athletics. The years he's going to go through to get to the Major Leagues, you know, going through the minors, who's to say he ever gets to that point? And as NFL, he can make more money. And I see more money for him and more in sponsorships than I do baseball because, really – and I don't want to offend the baseball people here. If you're a baseball fan and you're listening to this show, but how many baseball players do you see really selling a lot of big time advertisements on TV and other stuff? You don't really see it. Football players, you do. Yes, their faces are covered during the game, but if you're a superstar, especially at the quarterback position, more money is going to come your way with advertisement, endorsement deals, and stuff like that. So he'll be he'll be fine there. Um, should he start if he's drafted early, which I think he will be? We'll see. We'll see the situation. I, he's another guy. Maybe he needs to sit for a little bit. But if you bring in a Kyler Murray, a Heisman Trophy winner, he's followed Baker Mayfield, seeing what Lincoln Riley has done there. Your fans are going to want to see Kyler Murray play. And I know he told Major League Baseball teams, you know, I'm dedicated to baseball. So that's probably going to get asked of, of him at the Combine coming up. But... I think he made the right move going football over baseball, and some people will disagree. But uh, I, I really think he has a bright future in his career. Now, while I say Haskins may be the best prospect coming in, I would be shocked that Kyler Murray has a better career, though. So that's something to look at, and I'll be interested to see what team does pull the trigger on Kyler Murray in the draft. Next up is Duke's Daniel Jones. And I'll be honest with you, I did not know much about him before the Senior Bowl. And I did attend the Senior Bowl down in Mobile, Really fun to go to that game. And it's kind of funny. You're sitting near all the South fans. They kind of do treat it like it's a regular football game. They're rooting for the South. They want the South to win. So that was a lot of fun. Well, look at Daniel Jones. He looks like your typical NFL quarterback, you know, your prototype. He's six foot five, 220. Uh, he threw for two, 2,674 yards at Duke this past season. 22 touchdowns and nine interceptions. He had a completion percentage of 61 percent so that's less than both what haskins and murray did both were around the 70 percent mark but i will say this with his percentage 2017 he was a 57 percent passer he, he got better at that and got to 61 percent so that should show nfl scouts look he, he has improved in that area so perhaps he can take that 61 percent and get around 65 percent because i think that's where most NFL teams want their quarterbacks around a 65% mark on completion percentage. Uh, they love it if you get to 70, 70%, excuse me, like a Drew Brees would. But if you can stay around that 75%, you should be pretty good there. So I, I like what he's able to do uh, in that game. The North team was not playing well. And look, I know it's a senior bowl, very vanilla offense. There's not a lot there. You're not really looking at who wins the game. But he came in the second half. Throws three touchdowns. 
North took over the game. And it seemed like the team really rallied around him, and he brought a lot of energy, and the team around him really believed and gave him confidence. And he came in with confidence, the team got confidence, and they came out winning the game there, and he was the MVP, I believe, of the Senior Bowl with those two touchdowns. Uh, Player comparison is a recent one. I do when I watch him play just the way he moves a lot of last year's Josh Allen, except he does have a better completion percentage. I think he's a more accurate passer than Josh Allen. And then finally, uh, Drew Locke out of Missouri. Uh, Really great career there at Missouri. And it's going to be interesting to see what they do next. Derek Dooley in his second year's offense coordinator with Kelly Bryant coming in as a transfer from Clemson being their quarterback. But Drew Locke, and I had a hard time really coming up with a good comparison, NFL comparison for him. Um, it was really tough, so I'm really not going to go there. I may update that on next week's show, and I'll really take more time to think about who does he remind me of currently in the NFL. Just I just cannot put my, my finger on that one. But uh, honestly, his stats were were down compared to his junior season. In 2017, he broke the SEC record for touchdown passes. He threw 44 that season. So he goes from 44 to 28 in his senior season. And a lot of people look at that, wow, his stats went down. But a stat is important, and one I'm really harping on here, I really do believe NFL scouts really look at, and it's a very important stat that I hear about all the time, completion percentage. How accurate of a passer are you he was 63% this year after, in 2017, his record-breaking year being only 58%. And I do think Drew Locke got better against better competition this past season than he did in 2017 as well. 2017, a lot of his numbers were put up against bad teams or teams that were in transition. Because I remember he lit up Tennessee and Florida in the second half of that year in 2017. Was those teams were both in transitions with their head coaches leaving just a lot of turmoil around those two Programs. I do believe he was better against good competition. I think Derek Dooley, being in the NFL for a little bit there, did help him out. I think his mechanics are a lot better than they were his junior year. So I think Drew Locke is, is ready. I actually have these four quarterbacks. He may be the most pro-ready, in my opinion, than all of them that could start on day one. I just think Murray and Haskins' ceiling is a lot higher than Drew Locke. But I think... They also have a bigger floor. Like they, they could be bust. Better chance of I think Drew Locke has a better chance of being a average successful quarterback at worst in the NFL. It reminds me a little bit of Josh Rosen. That's how I feel about Josh Rosen last year. Baker Mayfield probably has the highest ceiling. Josh Allen talent wise does too. Uh, Sam Darnold, but Josh Rosen was a guy I said, but he has, you know, the more. Uh, capability or chances to come in year one and be steady, be a steady quarterback throughout his career, maybe not le- reach the peaks athletically that those other guys did, but still, more of a chance, less of a risk is basically what I, I'm trying to get about, get around to on how I feel about Drew Locke. So I'm going to do this again next week with some four other quarterbacks. Uh, of course, Need to break down Jarrett Stidham since I do cover the Auburn Tigers for last word on college football. Uh, so we'll be doing that uh, next weekend, looking at what teams do need a quarterback. Run through the NFL teams that do need a quarterback for next season. All right, real quickly, I'm going to get out of here. The Alliance American Football Week 3 was a lot of fun. The Saturday games were really good. The Arizona Salt Lake game was a good game. Shocking there that uh, Salt Lake would beat Arizona. But Salt Lake had their quarterback back, and they hadn't had him since the first half of the first game of the season when they played Arizona in Arizona with Rudgell. He got hurt. That game at halftime the first week was 19-16 to Arizona. Arizona put up over 30 points. He was not in game because of groin injury. Their offense wasn't good. Offense really wasn't that great last week with Austin Allen. They were better than him. So they got to win. I was shocked by that. Um, the Orlando-Memphis game was fun. I thought Orlando was going to run away with it early because receivers were open all over the place. Garrett Gilbert was playing well. Another good game by Garrett Gilbert, too. I think right now he's the best quarterback in the league, and it's starting to show. And Steve Spurrier is doing good things with him. 
On the Memphis side, Christian Hackenberg, he's just not any good. And the fact that Mettenberger was not the starting quarterback from the start really surprised me. I wonder what the coaches are seeing. I mean, Mettenberger was listed as a third-string quarterback. The only reason why he came in the second half because Brandon Silvers was nursing an injury, and he wasn't even active. I mean, let's just look at the stats. Hackenberg threw two and a half games, 52% completion percentage, only 277 yards passing, three interceptions, no touchdowns. Mettenberger, LSU product, in the second half against Orlando, was 9 of 12, 120, two touchdowns. Like I said, all second half, he was dropping dimes on Orlando defense, too. There were some passes down the field, which has been a complaint for the Alliance that a lot of the quarterbacks really aren't pushing the ball down the field. It's, you know, check downs, a lot of passes under 10 yards. Another quarterback, and I really think they just need to make a change here, Matt Sims at Atlanta, not playing well. He has thrown two touchdowns to six interceptions through three games. He's 59% completion percentage. And those two passes, touchdown passes he's thrown, that's all the touchdowns Atlanta has scored through three games. The offense is struggling. I mean, they kick a lot of field goals if they get in the red zone. Birmingham's really good defensively, but the fans were calling for Aaron Murray. They're 0-3. And they play at Arizona this week. They cannot afford another loss if they want to make any kind of run to potentially get to the playoffs. Aaron Murray, you have to play him. Who knows? He may not be all that good. We'll have to find out and see. But they need to give it a shot because it's just not working with Matt Sims. Uh, I'm going to take Arizona in that game. My other picks are San Diego at Memphis. I think Memphis will win this game with Matt Berger because they need to win. It's just kind of like with Atlanta. As good as Matt Berger played, you still lost last week. You're still an 0-3 football team. You need this win to have any chance at the playoffs. Orlando at Salt Lake, which that was going to be the early game on Bleach Report Live. They switched it, and that's going to be on NFL Network. I like Orlando here. Salt Lake got a good win last week, but I just don't think they're as good as Orlando. You got San Antonio at Birmingham. I don't know what's going on with San Antonio. They got run by San Diego last week, 31-11. to After playing well in the first game when they beat San Diego and playing well in the loss last week, the previous week, against Orlando. I'm going to take Birmingham there. I'm going to, their defense is really good. So I think Orlando and Birmingham will be undefeated when they play each other in week five, which I plan on attending that game. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. If you haven't checked out the Alliance, check it out. Uh, the ratings have been good for them. Of course, you know they had that big rating the first week uh, where they beat the NBA. I think it was a 2.9. And then in week two, the game on TNT did get over 1 million viewers, and the NFL Network games are getting half a million viewers. I know some people say, well, that's not really a lot. I mean, that's for a league like the Alliance. Let's call it what it is. Development football, minor league football, it's not the NFL, it's not major, it's not a major league. So for them to get the TV ratings they have got so far, that's pretty good. So hope they keep up that because I do enjoy watching the league every single week. I know they've had their problems kind of off the field, some other storylines going on there, but the on the field product's pretty good and seem like people are liking it. I hope I wish more people would go to the games. Uh, there's a couple cities that need better attendance, I think. But uh, product's good. People are out watching it on TV. So I hope they keep up the success. Anyway, guys, that's going to do it for this edition, the 48th edition of the Cover 2 with Philip Jordan. Uh, thanks again to Troy Sadowski for being on this edition of the show. Had a lot of fun talking to him, as always. Uh, remember, guys, you can find me on Twitter at the Phil Jordan. Find the show on Facebook. Just look up uh, the Cover 2 Football Report or Cover 2 Philip Jordan. You should be able to find it there. Uh, subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts. And uh, please uh, leave a review and rate it. If you do review the show, I will read it on a future edition of the show. I didn't do question of the week this week, guys. I know that. I'm sorry about that. If you do have a question for me, you can always send me an email at sportstalkphilipjordan at gmail.com. And uh, check out all my work over at Last Word on College Football. Hope everybody has a fantastic week, and I'll talk to you again next Wednesday. Bye-bye. Thank you for downloading the Cover 2 with Philip Jordan. Tune in next week for more great college and professional football talk. And subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts.